and gentlemen, a big, warm welcome for Mr. Daryl Siggers. Nineteen eighty four, east side of Detroit. I'm twenty years old. I'm going to my son and daughter's mother's house to see my children. I get there, she's there, my two children's there. Her cousin Mookie is there, and his friend Toby Red. So we drinking, smoking weed. A knock comes at the door, maybe a couple of hours later. Now it's about 11 o'clock. Three guys come in. They join in, so we all drinking and smoking weed. A confrontation breaks out. It's the three of them, James Montgomery, Bernard Jackson, and Derek Lawson, against me, Toby Red, and Mookie. So Christine comes out of the room, the mother of my two children, she said, listen, everybody got to go, but they resist. So she repeated again. I come to her aid, I said, listen, man, y'all got to go. So the fighting continues, one of the guys slugged me in the mouth. So Toby Red, he runs off, he says, I got something for y'all, lads, he leaves. Subsequently, they leave. Moments later, we hear gunshots. But gunshots ain't uncommon in the hood, so I don't really think nothing of it. I subsequently leave. I see police cars down the street, but that's not uncommon. So I go on. A couple of days later, Christine calls me. She said, listen, the police want to talk to you. I said, about what? She said, one of the guys that came that night was shot and killed. So she tells me, she gives them my number. A couple of hours later, they call me. They said, listen, uh, we want you to come down and talk to us. Now, me knowing the police that I grew up in is, Every time we've had any encounter with the police, it was not a good outcome. So I don't want nothing to do with them. I'm not going down and talk to them. I don't want to talk to them at all, period. So they called back. Now at this time, I'm living with my father. He tells me, look boy, talk to him. So he convinced me. They called back, they come out. They said, look, we just want to talk to you. As soon as they got out there, they cuff me, arrest me, and take me to jail. Now they interrogate me for about four or five hours, and they playing the good cop, bad cop routine. One of them real, real nice. The other one come in, asshole, we know you did this, you're gonna tell us you did this, and all this, da 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 da. He, he goes on and on and on. And I'm terrified because there's no one I can call. The people that are supposed to protect me is the ones who are terrorizing me right now. So this go on and on and on, but they don't get what they want from me. So they take me upstairs on the ninth floor. Now, it's February. One of the rooms, the windows is cracked, so it's cold. And so I think to myself, well, they're only going to leave me here for a little while, and they're going to come back and get me. But they don't. They leave me in there all night. Now, ain't nothing in this room but a wooden bench. That's it. And I'm, I'm freezing. So they bring me back down, and I'm suffering from the beginning stages of hypothermia. And so as I come back down, I'm so cold, I can't even feel my hands, and I'm, I done shivered all night, so I'm exhausted because I haven't had any rest. So they take me in the room. The nice guy comes in again. He say, um, you want some coffee? Want a sandwich? Some water or something? And I said, yeah. He don't bring it. The mean guy comes in again. 
And he just keeps repeating, we know you did this. You're going to tell us you did this. We know somebody told us you did it. That, he just goes on and on and on with this as if the more he keeps telling me that I've done it, that I'm going to subsequently agree with him that I've done it. But he don't get nothing out of me. So this goes on and on and on. And they, I am so exhausted and I'm so tired and I'm so full of fear and I'm so scared because they done victimized and terrorized me, but there's nothing I can do. And his face, his face is this close to mine. He's screaming and howling and calling me asshole, nigger, everything he can trying to break my spirit and make me confess to a crime I didn't commit. So I listen to this and I listen to this. And so his breath is so bad, I can smell it right now today. I can still smell it, you know. And he, he, he's, he, he's, he, he, he's screaming and hollering. So he leave out. So they don't get what they want. They take me to jail. So when I get to jail, I cannot believe what I'm seeing. I mean, I'm looking at drunks and drug addicts all over the floor. I mean, it's dirt and grime and the stench is so bad. I feel like I'm in a nightmare. I'm saying to myself, what did I do to deserve this? This cannot be real. How can I be here? Why am I here? And so these rooms are built for like maybe 25 people. They got 50 people in them. So it's so crowded. There's people all on the benches. There's nowhere to sit. I mean, it's so dirty and nasty. So I'm standing in one spot. I can't move nowhere else because they got it jammed in like sardines. But I refuse to sit on this dirty floor. So I'm going to stand. So I stand for about six hours until I couldn't stand no more. So there was nothing for me to do but sit down. And I can't stretch out because there's nowhere to stretch out, so I sit down. And this goes on. I stay in this county jail for like six months. <laughs> and, they, and they keep moving us from bullpen to bullpen to bullpen. And there's nothing I can do. My father, he came to see me one day. And he said, boy, there's nothing I can do to help you. He said, because I, I got in trouble when I was younger. I mean, I had... You know, I remember a lady had some pigeons, and I threw rocks at them because they, stay, they, they pooped everywhere. So she would go tell my father. He would come get me and make me apologize. Or I hit a ball through a person's window and break their window. He would go talk to the neighbors. He could fix that. He said, but boy, I can't fix this. This is over my head. He said, I don't want to see you like this no more. And he never came to see me again. And it was the hardest conversation I ever had in my life. He said, boy, I can't stand to see. So he left. So I don't know what to do at this point because I, we don't have the money to hire a lawyer. So they sent me a state lawyer, a court-appointed lawyer, let me say. He comes to see me. He got on earth shoes, a tweed hat, and a trench coat. I remember this even today. So I don't trust him. You know, he looked like a police. So I don't trust him. I don't want to talk to him. So we don't get along. I don't even know he's my lawyer at this time because I haven't confirmed it. So moving forward after these six months, we get to the trial. I'm going to the trial and I'm seeing, they talking about jury instructions, the Michigan rules of evidence, all these different processes and procedures that I don't understand what they're talking about. But one thing I know for sure is I'm in trouble. As I sit there, so they bring on these cast of characters and these, all these guys coming on, they testifying and they saying, he did this and he did this. And I, I lean over and I tell them, I say, man, they lying. That did not happen. And I continue to tell him this. And he leans over once to me and says, shut up, stop acting like a kid and let me listen to the testimony. I never spoke to him again during the trial. He said it in such a way, like, and at this time, I'm suffering from a, a form of what I like to refer to as plantation psychosis. Because I believe that whatever the white man say is the truth. It's got to be right. I don't understand because I'm not educated. When I look back at myself and, and the condition that I was in at that time, I like to consider myself, I, I, I frame it as a functionally illiterate man child trapped in the ghetto of his own mind. Because all I could see was my life experience and my own ignorance at that time. And so we go through the process, and they get a police officer that comes up there, this so-called ballistic firearm expert, he come up there and say, 
Well, we found a bullet in the defendant's home that matched the bullet taken out of the deceased body. And the bullet, they had identical lands and grooves. And so when the jury hear this, they're like, what else do they need? We found a bullet in your home that matched the bullet in the dead man's body. You're guilty. But they deliberate for three days. And every day they bringing me back. I got to sit in this bullpen for like 15 hours. Because when they're deliberating, you don't go in the courtroom. And it's nothing but a steel bench. And it's cold steel. And they got this air conditioner on. All I got on this little short, little flimsy jail outfit. And so, again, I am so, the whole process has just exhausted me. Because I, could, I can't phantom, why am I here? It still hasn't occurred to me that this is just the way the system is. And so... And nobody can help me. I can't depend on my lawyer. My father don't want to come back and see me, so I don't know what to do. And I'm ignorant. I'm illiterate to the law. I don't know anything. So they're deliberating. And they're taking me. And every night, I got to go back through this whole process. By the time I get back up to what they refer to as the rock, it's like 12 o'clock. I got to get up at 4. And they take me from bullpen to bullpen to bullpen. And I'm just so exhausted. I'm so tired of this whole process, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. So we get back, they said it reached a verdict. I go in, and for some reason, I'm just believing that the system is gonna be fair. Even though I done seen all the movies and I heard about my brother them told me stories, my father told me stories about how the system really is, I'm still expecting them to be fair. I say I'm innocent. I, I know they're gonna come back with not guilty, so I'm taking my Bible to court with me, I'm praying every day, I'm talking to God, and they come back and they say, guilty. And I'm so, I'm, I'm devastated when I hear this. I sit down and I'm just, I, I couldn't even see anymore. I just sat down. And so um, they chained me up like a slave. They put belly chains on me, around my waist, around my ankles and everything. And they lead me out to the courtroom. So I come back for sentencing. And the judge says, I am sentencing you to prison for the rest of your natural life for first degree murder. Now, when you hear this, I don't know what to think. But at this point, I am so numb. I am so tired. I am so exhausted that nothing anybody else can say to me, it, it don't even, it don't, it don't, it don't, it don't hurt me. It don't touch me because I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I'm, I'm just, my, I'm mentally drained. So they chained me up again like a slave. I got the duck walk out to court. And they chained me up to about 15 other guys. They put us all in chains. And they put us on this big old bus. And they take me to what is called the Michigan Reformatory, the oldest prison in the state of Michigan. It was built in the 1800s. And it's got bats flying around in this place. So they leave me. And this place looks so scary. When I'm looking up at this, and it's on a hill. It's on a hill. You got to go up in this hill. And ain't nothing but white folks in this place. Ain't nothing. No black guards or nothing. So when I get in, they take the chains off us one by one. And I can hear the chains hitting the ground as they taking them off us. Clean, clean, clean. Each one they taking them off of us. So then they tell us, they searching us, each one of us. Now we, they said, take off everything you got on. They want you to get butt naked. So we strip, take off everything. And now they want you to bend over and look up in you so they can make sure you haven't smuggled any contraband into their prison. So it's the most degrading, most dehumanizing experience of my life. I just cannot believe it. I feel like I'm in a twilight zone because I just can't phantom. Why am I here? I haven't done anything. And I prayed to God, why, why me? I can't figure it out. So they take us to another room. And they give us a bedroll, and they give us some jail clothes to put on, and some flip-flops. We put them on, and then they take us up to what is called the rock, and they disperse us to different places. And when I get here, all I can see is just, it's sails for as far as the eye can see. And I'm like, what is this? And so he's, he's, he, he, he's escorting me down the hall, and guys is hollering at me, no meat on the rod, fish ass motherfucker, we're gonna stab your bitch ass, ho ass nigga. And I'm like, thinking to myself, why are they angry at me? They don't even know me. And so he said, ignore them. 
He keep walking. He, he escorted me. He got me by the arm. I got my bed rolling this arm, and he, and he escorted me down. So I keep going, and he get halfway now. And then he radios to the officer at the front. He said, open up, sell, such and such and such. And he opens it up. And he says, step in. So I pause for a minute. I said, step in. I'm looking in there. It's a cage. It's literally a cage. And there's nothing in there but a, a, a roller mat, a toilet, and a bed with a, a piece of steel. And he ushered me in. And he slammed the door behind me. Boom! And I could hear that jarring sound of that steel, the door clanging shut, and it, 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 it shakes me. And so I'm looking at this, and I'm like, what? I'm just, I'm blown away by this whole experience. So I, want, I, I refuse at this moment to just to sit on this bed. So I throw the bed roll on there, and I stand for as long as I can, just looking out the bars. And remember what the judge said, the rest of your natural life, the rest of your natural life, the rest of your natural life. It's going through my mind, and tears flowing down my face. And I'm saying, what do I do now? So I get so tired, I can't stand no more. So I got to lay down. I lay down. Next day, I'm seeing fights and stuff like this, and it's, it's a zoo. And I'm like, man, how will I survive this? So I'm walking the yard, and an older gentleman come up to me and say, young fella, you walk around trying to act tough. What you need to do is get in the law library, learn the law so you can get your butt out of here. So I said, well, what is the law library? He said, come out tomorrow, and I'm going to show you. So I come out. He takes me to the law library. And I'm just amazed at all of these books. So he's teaching me. So as I begin to read the law, the more I read, the more I want to read. The more I learn, the more I want to learn. Because now I'm feeling more empowered. Because now I understand these court rules that they use. I understand these Michigan rules of evidence that they use. I understand these, all of these jury instructions. I understand this stuff. So now I'm, I'm, I'm understanding this process. So as I began to feel the importance of education, my father and mother always taught us education, education, education. If you want that big car, get education. If you want a nice house, get education. Because education provides us with the ability to make informed life choices. So he teaches me, he teaches me. So now I begin to file appeals. And now I'm filing these appeals. And it's like, I came in 84, so now it's like 86. But in 85, now I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I don't got no GED, nothing. but in 85, I get my GED, 90 days. 87, I get my associate's degree, like that. I'm, now I'm going for my bachelor's degree, but they cut out the program. So, but I'm still studying, and I'm studying about philosophy, and I'm learning about history, and the Civil War, and the Revolutionary War, and I'm studying about W.B. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, Mark, Marcus Garvey, uh, Nelson Mandela. I'm studying all this about apartheid, the Black Panther movement, and I'm learning about history. And so now I'm feeling like I'm feeling myself because now I know myself. And so I'm filing these appeals. I filed my first appeal, 86, 88. They denied. I'm devastated because I've studied this stuff. I know what I put in these briefs, I know what these lawyers put in these briefs are supposed to get me out, because this is the truth. But see, there's a difference between what is written in the law and what is written in the system, because the system is something totally different. And I didn't understand the system. So one of the definitions of the rule of law said law is a tool used to settle disputes. And who settles the disputes? The judges do, and they use the law as a tool to settle the dispute any way they choose. So the real law is those judges. So you have to appeal to those judges and not just rely solely on these weak pleadings that we've been filing. Because that's just, law is just a bunch of abstract legal theories that are subject to interpretation. But every law that says one thing, there's another one that says something else. I didn't really learn that because I'm still idealistic. I learn, I'm learning myself and I'm learning the law, but again, I'm not learning the system. So now I don't want to another level because now I'm learning the system. So I file another appeal. I go all the way through the federal court, 
All the United States Supreme Court denied, denied, denied. And I can't believe this. I'm like, wow, what, what do I have to do? And so as time goes on, now I'm in about like 15 years. And I done filed all these appeals. Denied, denied, denied. Then in 2004, the University of Michigan appointed me four law students from the, like the Innocence Project. So they get on the case and they go out to the crime scene. I love these young people because they got the heart. They got the, they, they so enthusiastic and they go out and look and they prove that I was innocent. They proved that these people who say they seen this crime could not have seen it from where they say they saw it from. It was just physically impossible. 11 o'clock at night, um, you know, dark, no street lights in general area of the crime scene, none of that. They come back and they tell me what they found. So they do this for about two years. They coming up to see me and we stand out there on the visit for hours, standing, I'm going over transcripts, I'm telling them to ask me questions and stuff. So we prepare this motion for new trial. We put it together. But I tell them about this particular judge who had sentenced me, who was pure evil. She was pure evil. So, but they don't, they, 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 they're not listening to me. They, they're idealistic. They're thinking that if the law's on their side and they're telling the truth, we can go in the courtroom and the judge is going to grant this motion. So I had three, prof three professors and four law students. We all go in the courtroom. They prepared, they prepared the plea and they submitted to the judge. And she did something that was the most despicable, unprofessional thing. She dogged them, I'm talking about in ways, she called them liars and said they concocted this story to get me out. I'm talking about she went all the way out on them. I mean, didn't even give them a chance. She wouldn't even let the students talk at all. And then the professor, he wasn't even prepared because the students one had studied the case. So he got up there and tried to do his thing. She chopped him down like a cedar. And so, when she denied a motion, I'm so hurt. They take me back, chain me up, take me back to the bullpen. But before when I look back, they crying real tears. I can see the black mascara running down their face and I'm so hurt because they didn't deserve that. They didn't deserve it. Here are some students that came. They, they, all they want to do is help. These are college students. They don't got no ax to grind. They ain't got no, they want to just do what is right. And they said, don't, and, and they said, don't take my word for it. Look at the evidence. You ain't got to take out, look at the evidence. She don't want to see the evidence. Because in her, in her mind, it's to say that she did something wrong. So she's more concerned with her own ego than it is my rights. So they come back to the bullpen, and I'm crying. And I don't want them to see me crying, because I'm so hurt. So I turn away from them. I walk away. I said, just go on. Please, just go. I've caused y'all enough pain. I've caused y'all enough hurt. Please, just leave me. Just go. Everybody else done left me. Just go but they won't leave. They said, Daryl, come over here. Daryl, come over here. We are not leaving you. So they all put their hands up on the window in a sign of solidarity and stacked their hands. They said, come over here. Put your hand on the window. Put your hand on the window. So I put my hand up there, and they still crying. One of them was so short, she had to tiptoe just to look in the window, just to see me, you know? <laughs> and so they leave. They shackle me, take me back to the prison. One of the professors came to see me and said, well, Daryl, nothing really, nothing else can be done for you. We did the best we could. And but the students wouldn't give up. They continued to file appeal after appeal after appeal. Denied, denied, denied. Then in 2008, I found out the Detroit Crime Lab had closed down because they were submitting false ballistic evidence in a lot of cases. And so I began to study this stuff, but I don't really understand the science of ballistic identification because this is a new science to me. I'm a city boy, I don't know nothing about this stuff. So in 2013, now, I done been in prison at this time 30 years. So they bring computers into the prison, and I began to study, and I began to type in keywords, uh, ballistic identification, firearm identification. So then I began to understand what this stuff is really about. So I hire an expert. This expert, he comes on, and within like two months, he, find, he writes me back and says, listen, man, what they did to you was truly a tragedy of justice. He said, the bullet that they said they got out of your home had four lands and grooves, and the bullet they said they got out of the deceased body had 12. It was impossible for them to match. And he explained why. He said, when barrels are designed, 
they are designed with a certain number of lands and grooves in a barrel. So if you shoot a barrel 50,000 times, it's going to still have the same number of lands and grooves. So one has four, another one has 12. It is scientifically impossible for them to have been fired from the same weapon. So we present this stuff. Now my old judge, this more old evil. <laughs> person. <laughs> I'm going to try to take the high road. She retires. And here's another thing. When, 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 when this one lawyer, I was trying to get her to raise this issue for me, and I know I got a certain amount of time. She told me, she said, listen, I could take your money. She said, but it'd be a waste of your time and waste of my time and your money because this judge ain't going to do nothing for you. This was 2011. She just said, you got to wait until she retires. So I got to wait four years. Four years. That's a sense in itself. But I wait because I know she's telling me the truth. So she retired, and they appoint me another sister, beautiful sister. She, she granted this motion. We filed a motion for new trial. She granted within six months. And they bring me before, and she looks, and she looks at them, because she knows this is science. You ain't got to take my word, but this is science. So then the Conviction Integrity Unit that's created, that uh, Kim Worthy recently created, they go and look at the docket, and they said, look, let us take a look at this case. Why don't you file a motion to hold this case in the band? Let us take a look at this. They take a look at the case. They go talk to the witnesses. They find out these guys, one of the witnesses has been convicted of perjury, bank robbery, safe cracking, uh, possession of weapons, possession of all this stuff that they don't tell my lawyer. And maybe he had a responsibility to go find this stuff out for itself, but he was, over, he was overworked and underpaid, so I'm not, I don't blame him. Because ignorance of the law is no excuse, and I was the one that was ignorant to the law. And so I should have found ways to do it myself. I just believe whatever position a man finds himself is his own responsibility. So anyway, they get involved with the case. Now, the lawyer that they appointed me, another state appointed, state appointed lawyer, he told me, this is a new unit. I don't know if they're going to grant this. You got a 50-50 shot. He said, you will have a decision by Tuesday. So I'm sitting in my room. Officer comes down. He said, Sigurds. You got to call. Your lawyer wants you to call him. I go down there, get on the phone, I call him, and the first three words out of his mouth, they vacated your conviction. Right. 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 So when he tell me this, I'm so filled with emotion that, because I'm, I'm almost expecting a denial. I've been to the United States Supreme Court three times. I done filed five habeas corpuses, four motions for new trial, spent hundreds of thousands, thousands of dollars on lawyers that they, you know, that's a whole nother story. But, so when he tell me this, I feel like I'm almost like in the matrix or something because my vision began to narrow, movement began to slow down, and it was like somebody put some earmuffs on me or something because I couldn't hear nothing else he said. He kept talking, and I had to say, I said, listen, man, I need a moment to compose myself. He said, what? I said, he keep talking. I said, I need a moment. I said, let me call you back in five minutes. So I, I get off the phone. I go down in my room, and I get on my knees, and I thank God, and I cry. And, 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 and I had told some of my friends, because they was expecting a decision just as well as I was. So they, they come to the room, and they see me crying. They say, man, what happened, man? They, they, they denied. They just assumed that they had denied because I'm crying. I said, no, they granted. So we jump around. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so they vacate my conviction. And, and here's the ironic thing about this. They did it on July 19th. And so... One of the things that helped me in this process, when I say education, as I said, education provides us with the opportunity to make informed life choices. You begin to learn about the different sciences. You begin to learn about whatever it is you're trying to do. You need to educate yourself. And that's one of the problems with a lot of the young people I see today walking around with their pants sagging, calling themselves niggas and all these other type of... Once, see, if, you, if, you, if you study self and learn about your history, Learn about Africa, learn about Egypt, learn about the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, the Constitution. See, had I known 
and educated myself, I would have known that during this interrogation process, when they were terrorizing me, all I had to do was invoke my Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. Or my Sixth Amendment right to say, I want a lawyer. And once you say that, all questioning must cease. I could have folded my arms and said, do what y'all got to do. But I didn't have that education. I didn't have that knowledge. So I encourage all young people, old people, everybody, the, the power of education cannot be underestimated. Look, when I went to prison, I was filled with so much anger, hatred, bitterness, because the system had failed me. But once I began to study, once I began to learn, it opened up a whole new world for me. My mind began to expand. expand. I began to learn you know, different uh, sciences. I began to study about the Black Panther movement. I began to study about, as I said, W.B. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, and some of the great pioneers of society. And it just, it changed my perspective from being hateful to being loving. I began to learn about the law of attraction. I began to learn about how what you put out into the universe, that's what you get back. So, when, so as you become better and do better, better things will happen for you and to you. But that's what you got to put out there. And in, everything, in every lesson, there's a blessing. You just got to look for it. And so I encourage people to learn as much as you can. And I ain't just talking about the academics of school. I'm talking about the common knowledge of history, of just life itself, so that you can be better, think better, do better, and just do what you have to do. And see, we have to, I tell you, learn what you have to do to help humanity. And so my reparations, my, my feeling on reparations is that you must educate yourself. Because I don't have no faith in the government. They didn't show me that, uh, you know, their process and procedure. I have no faith in them. I have no faith that they're going to do the right thing. Particularly when I see our president who tell people, for them, go back to your own countries. You know, that type of stuff. I have no faith in the government. But educate yourself. Learn as much as you can about self. And you can free your own mind. Because see, some of us is enslaved right now. We're free, but we, we in bondage in our own mind. A lot of us are suffering from plantation psychosis and don't even know it. I'm not going to take up much time. Thank you all. My name is Daryl Sickles. Daryl Sickles.